Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So, um, thank you guys for showing up. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Steve Benford uh, here today. He's actually here for uh, today and tomorrow. And Steve is, the, uh, is a professor of collaborative computing in the Mixed Reality Laboratory at Nottingham. And he is the director of the EPSRC-funded doctoral training center in ubiquitous computing for the digital economy. And um, he's received numerous uh, best paper awards over the years and um, has co-authored a book. It's actually um, right in the back if you want to check it out, Performing Mixed Reality. He, he told me he has a few copies. Actually one. <laughs> <laughs> one copy. And has recently been awarded a two-year uh, Dream Fellowship by the UK's Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, and I believe uh, he's traveling under that, that funding at the moment. Yeah. And uh, I think the most uh, interesting thing about Steve's work is that he manages to do uh, lots of really interesting um, uh, interesting performance-based work and um, artistic and creative uh, performances, uh, while also uh, making uh, some really interesting scholarly contributions on those works. And, and I think that's the that's the trick, and that's the really valuable thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your introduction, and thank you uh, very much for inviting me to, to talk to you as well. Um, so yes, for the past... 10 to 15 years, uh, myself and people in the lab seem to have fallen into a mode of working with artists, particularly those with a background in kind of theatre and performance, to create and tour and study a series of kind of interactive performance works uh, and to use that as a sort of a vehicle for driving forward our interests in human computer interaction. And um, today I'm going to draw on a kind of at least one of the examples of, of that, that work, and try and pull out some general principles, perhaps, for how we might design what I, I'm going to argue is kind of a sense of the extended user experience. Um, before we, we get into it, though, I'll just say a kind of few quick words, I guess, about why we choose to work with artists, in particular in a way that we think of as being artist-led. And what that means is very often it's the artists who come to us with the idea for the project that they want to do, and we kind of figure out how we can help them realise it, technically, and then we try and study it and figure out what went on. And so why do we do artist-led research? Well, I think there are three reasons. One, artists are extremely creative, certainly compared to ourselves. They have ideas that stretch technologies and do interesting things with emerging technologies that we just wouldn't have. So that's number one. Number two is public performance uh, is a fantastic way of conducting research in the wild, of getting these technologies into the hands of real people albeit under a somewhat unusual situation, and figuring out what happens. And if you were kind of working, I think, in highly regulated fields, medicine, transportation, or whatever, you, you might struggle to do that. But many of these projects we've turned around from meeting the artist to rolling out the project, you know, in kind of in two to three months. It's, it's as quick as that. So it's a very flexible thing. And thirdly, and most importantly, this stuff is just important. Creative and cultural uses of, of computing are an extremely important thing economically in terms of the creative industries and to us as human beings. Expressing ourselves and being creative is a core human value that we need to support. So damn it, it's just important. So, as I say, we worked, I guess, 10 to 15 years probably with somewhere between six and 10 artist groups, probably created in that period uh, 20 or so different works. And here's some of the bits of work that I'm not going to talk about uh, in this lecture. Um, one of our longest standing collaborations is with a group of artists called Blast Theory, who we've worked with since kind of 1997. And the book documents their work uh, and the work we've done with them quite extensively. So Can You See Me Now is a piece of work in which people on the streets of a real city who are actors chased people who were online in a, a virtual model of that city and their audio was streamed out online as well and the online players could lead them a sort of merry dance through the city. And we studied that. Our, our approach to studying these things in the wild is to use, here I go, ethno-methodologically informed ethnography. Practiced that for many years with Dr Andy Crabtree hitting me with a stick until I said it right. Uh, 
And, and that revealed all sorts of interesting things. In this case, it revealed lots of things about how the seams in the technologies, the partial coverage of Wi-Fi and the flakiness of GPS, had to be accommodated in how the experience was orchestrated. And that was interesting. Uh, another blast theory work I, I have spoken about here before, won't be talking about today, was Day of the Figurines. This was a month-long text messaging adventure game for mobile phones, but that you played very slowly. You only sent and received a few messages each day. So the game was kind of was interwoven or became interwoven with the, the fabric of your everyday life. There was also a, a rather bizarre framing interface that was this kind of tabletop interface where the figurines would move around that was in a venue that you might only ever see once during the whole month at the beginning, but that somehow framed or, or, or gave you a sense of what the experience was about. And we published we published work about the episodic nature of play and engagement with a slow game. We managed to, to write a bit about the design of that table, but I'm not talking about that today. Um, 2008, we began a series of collaborations with uh, Brendan Walker, there he is, a um, bit of a TV personality in the UK, and uh, a thrill engineer, he would uh, style himself as, and a part-time roller coaster designer, among other things. And Brendan first came to us because he wanted uh, a series of technologies that would enhance the spectator experience of roller coasters. So we built a, a telemetry system that took video and audio from these head-mounted cameras, very close up, quite intimate video of people's faces, heart rate, galvanic skin's response, and in later versions, the movements of those two facial muscles that I can't remember their names for smiling and frowning, and the system didn't interpret this stuff, but rather it was displayed for spectators to see on large screens. You had a very close-up view of someone else's ride experience. And then more recently, we've worked with Brendan um, to think about how you can use some physiological measures uh, to actually start to control ride experiences. And we built a couple of rides in which you use breath or breathing to control the ride. And breathing is very interesting because it's only under partial control. At times, you can control your breathing remarkably well. It's kind of what I'm doing in being able to speak. At other times, you can't control it at all. Uh, you have to breathe after a certain amount of time. Um, and if you build a ride that responds to, to breathing, you can bring people to a, a really delicious tipping point between control and loss of control. And after all, what are amusement roller coasters about if it's not about giving up control to something. That's, that's where a lot of the thrill lies. Uh, in Breathless, which was a powered swing, we went as far as to put the breathing respirator sensors inside a, a rubberized gas mask. So just to really up the ante and make you tune into your own feelings about your breathing, you were wearing this gas mask and controlling this powered swing. So those are four bits of work that I'm not going to talk about. Um, but I could have probably picked anyone to talk about this notion of trajectories that I'm going to come to later in the talk, because they do all reflect it. But I'm going to just pick on one piece of work, and apologies if some of you have seen it before, because it is quite an old one. It's 2003 now, which is pretty much ancient. But um, this was a blast theory piece of work, and it, it just, I guess because it's quite a complex structure, it just serves to illustrate many of the points that I want to make later on. So we'll quickly have a look at Uncle Roy all around you as a nice example of what I guess we're kind of calling this genre of mixed reality performance. Uh, the mixed reality performance as a phrase is really meant to convey a couple of things. Firstly, the idea of performances that somehow mix the real and the virtual, whatever that is, which Uncle Roy does. And secondly, the idea of mixing digital content and media with live performance from actors, possibly, or from the participants who become actors in some sense. Anyway, Uncle Royal Around You is a, a performance come game that takes place parallel, in parallel on the streets of the city and online. On the streets of the city, you arrive at a venue, your personal possessions are sort of taken away from you, and instead you are given a, 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 a device and asked to head out into the city and find Uncle Roy. That was, that was the, your job. And you followed a series of quite ambiguous sort of location-based clues that led you on a dance through the city, eventually to an office that it was claimed was Uncle Roy's office and you were asked to go in, and from there to a phone box, and from there to a car, and you were asked to get in the car, and various things happened to you. 
And as a, an online player, you could have the same experience but from a different point of view. You could enter a virtual model, somewhat fantastical, of this part of the city. You could see where the street players were. You could chat to other online players. But most importantly, you could find out things that these people didn't know. In particular, where is Uncle Roy's office in the city? And once you'd got that piece of information, you could try and build a relationship to a, a street player by sending them messages and getting messages back and guide them to Uncle Roy's office if you wanted to be helpful or mess them about and get them lost if you didn't. Um, at some point in the experience, both kinds of players, at slightly different points, are asked a series of questions about uh, whether they would trust in strangers and to what extent they would trust in strangers and would they be prepared to enter a year-long contract with a stranger in which if this person ever calls them up, uh, they would give them help. And if they say yes, we take their contact details and we exchange it with someone later on in the game and they get a postcard two weeks later that says, if you need help, call this person. So I've got a bit of a video of Uncle Roy. Uh, find it. It's fairly long, we won't look at it all. But just to give you a bit of the, uh, the flavour of the, the work. Takes a couple of seconds to kick in. Uncle Royal Around You is a game which sets online players alongside players on the streets of the city. Equipped with a handheld computer, street players are sent out into the city in search of Uncle Roy. Online players explore a virtual model of the same area of the city. They can follow the progress of street players and communicate with them via audio and text messages. Each street player has only 60 minutes to find Uncle Roy. Online players can uncover the location of Uncle Roy's office and so guide street players to their destination. This is a game in which you walk around the surrounding area using one of these. This map shows mm -hmm. the game area. Mm -hmm. To move around it, Tap on the me icon and drag it. Mm -hmm. This like is a phone, the microphone. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. but different. You'll need to speak into this to record messages to online players. Mm -hmm. Your first instruction is as follows. Mm -hmm. Head for a location in the park. Uncle Roy will send you a message indicating where this is. Once you get there, tap I am here. Okay. I'm doing well. I need to wait for someone coming the opposite direction. Gently turn and follow them. Uh, just pause for a moment there. I mean, I mentioned the clues were ambiguous. And uh, could give a longer talk about the nature of ambiguity in interface design, which a number of people have, have written about recently. Um, very interesting example of ambiguity here. So I think the ambiguity here, in part, lies in... Uh, the f in blurring the frame of the experience. So the frame of the experience refers to having an understanding of what is within the experience and what is without. It's the set of often unwritten conventions by which you know that something is fictional or not when you're watching it, uh, for example. And in this case, this clue kind of plays with that. The idea that someone's going to walk across the bridge in St. James's Park and you should turn and follow them invites a whole series of quite difficult to interpret 
uh, possibilities here. Should I just turn and follow the first stranger who walks across the bridge? Am I waiting for an actor? How will I know what they look like? Uh, is everyone in London an actor who's employed in the game? Who knows? Anyway, so a bit of an aside, but that's what I kind of meant by ambiguity. Uh, and it's an interesting tactic, again, for generating um, uh, a bit of thrill and a bit of excitement at perhaps some risk. Okay, so this video rolls for a while. Let's, um, let's pick up Jen a bit later on. Okay, so I'll... A little bit earlier than this, though. Uh, so she finds Uncle Roy's office. Well, he does first. Uh, when she enters the office, the online player gets to see her for the first time on a kind of video surveillance uh, link, and he gets his interview about trusts and strangers and contracts and things, while she's asked to look around the office, write a postcard, and do various other bits. Then she's directed to a phone box, where she gets a phone call, and from there to, to the car, the limousine. you a few questions and I'd appreciate it if you would answer the questions as honestly as possible. Yeah. I bet. So um, and again ethnographic studies of Uncle Royal around you revealed all sorts of interesting stuff about how it was designed, put together, how the technologies worked, all manner of things and a, a number of papers flowed. So um, over the years you know, roll out a number of projects such as these, uh, conduct a number of studies, publish the results, that's well and good, academic life continues. But you do begin to wonder slightly about the bigger picture and what we began to wonder was, you know, what, there's something interesting about these experiences. Okay, we're working with performers who are definitely at the extreme end of creating certain kinds of experiences. I'm not suggesting that Uncle Royal around you was a mainstream game, but, but our view is they were, they were kind of pushing the envelope and take, taking entertainment or cultural experiences to, into some new place. And we wanted to get a bigger sense of what was it these experiences are about and how are they put together. In other words, we wanted to sit back and do a bit of theorizing as much as anyone in our neck of the woods does theorizing. So, um, so this is what we started to figure. First of all, we, we were struggling to characterize these experiences in terms of uh, any of the kind of existing paradigms that are out there. Well, there are lots of paradigms. It's virtual reality and then augmented reality and then mixed reality. But Uncle Royal Around You seems to be simultaneously several of those at the same time. There's, there's tangible computing and mobile computing, but Day of the Figurings had both tangible and mobile interfaces. There's location-based, there's this and that. What's interesting is the artists don't really seem to care about that. They take whatever is to hand and deliberately mix it up to create something else. So these experiences are online and on the streets and tangible and mobile and whatever, all at the same time. So I think what characterizes them at first glance is, is two things. Uh, first of all is, to some extent, they're extended. Now, of course, it depends what you mean by extended. I mean, they're not extended yet into years. They're not lifelong. But they're extended beyond the moment of interaction with a single interface. If you're designing, if you're an HCI person, you're no longer in the business of designing how you interact with one thing, but rather how many things are stitched together into something that's larger. And I would call that a, a user experience. I know that UX has become synonymous, again, with the design of the one thing, with the interface. But my sense is there is a bigger notion of having an experience in Uncle Roy for an hour. And the structure of that experience is pretty complex. It, it's got real and virtual spaces, sometimes that appear to be overlaid, sometimes that appear to be juxtaposed or somehow adjacent. It's got complex time scales. I won't talk about those. There isn't time. It has quite complex role structures. There are online players and players on the streets. Um, there are actors, there are people behind the scenes. There are members of the public who are somehow involved as spectators or bystanders. And it has a whole bunch of interfaces. 
So that's not a very exciting conclusion in many ways. It just says, well, they're extended and they consist of lots of stuff. So what we wanted to do was start to find a way of articulating uh, what we thought the artists were doing and what fundamentally these experiences are about. And for that, uh, we eventually turned to a notion of trajectories. Uh, and so for this part of the talk, I'm going to make an argument, uh, being a computer scientist, abstracting away just a few concepts, providing a framework that all experiences, at least of this kind, can be described in terms of trajectories, and er, uh, that's it. Well, not really. And that there are just three fundamental kinds of trajectory, and er, uh, that's it. And I'll try and convince you of that. So let's have a go. So firstly, the unifying principle of these things, I think, is, is of taking people on a journey. That's actually quite important. It's not the destination that matters. Uncle Roy and many of these experiences, it's not about reaching an endpoint. It's not a task or a goal. It is the journey that matters. It's having a good experience on the way, all the way, is what you're trying to design for. And they can be described in terms of trajectories. Why is a trajectory a good metaphor to use? Um, one thing that we feel it captures is a sort of continuity of experience. Uh, we'll come back to that later on. I've put ideal because there are episodes and breaks, sometimes deliberate and sometimes unavoidable. But underneath all of the things we looked at, it felt like there was something that was meant to flow like a thread of experience. Secondly, trajectories inherently capture the idea of there being individual routes through experience. You have yours, I have mine. Trajectory is something that can be steered and shaped by external forces. Perhaps not so overtly, but it can be bent and moved around in certain ways. And that's something that I'll come back to later on that we felt we saw going on. Trajectories are interwoven with one another, the threads of experience, to create some kind of social fabric to to kind of, I don't know, I'm mixing my metaphors, but that's interesting. We wanted something that captured the way in which different people's experiences would sometimes overlap, sometimes not, and would, would interweave as part of a larger whole. But frankly, also, I mean, it's not really our idea. The notion of interject, interactional trajectories is already out there in the HCI literature. And of course, the notion of trajectories is everywhere in all sorts of fields, from physics to, to social sciences. Um, but in particular, several people had already published about the idea of there being interactional trajectories. For example, um, Christian Heath and colleagues at King's College London had studied museum interactions and had pointed out how one person's interaction with an exhibit often serves to configure the next person's route into it and interaction with it. Christian has a, an example of uh, somebody interacting with um, a bolt on the frame of an exhibit in the Science Museum, not actually with the exhibit itself. I don't know why they're interested in the bolt. Perhaps they're an engineer, or perhaps they're looking to make a garden shed at home or something. Who knows? But they, they interact with the bolt and they head on. And of course, the next person who comes in interacts with the bolt and heads on, and the next person who comes in does the same. It's a beautiful example of you know, how there is a trajectory into an interface and through it, that the moment of, if you like, interaction begins quite a long time before you pick up the mouse, press the button, are at the table or whatever. So that was already out there. We just wanted to push it a bit further and to think about how it worked in the large. So, OK, I said before, there are three kinds of trajectories out of which such experiences appear to be made. And the first is the canonical trajectory. Uh, this, if you like, is the plan, the designers, artists, performers' intent defined mostly beforehand, mostly, and probably expressed in various ways through scripts, set designs, lists of instructions, and of course through code in computers. I've shown the canonical trajectory as being just kind of one line that flows through the piece, but actually any experience may have several canonical trajectories. Uncle Royal around you has at least a, cano a canonical trajectory for street players and a different one that's de designed for online players. And moreover, of course, these things can branch and merge again in experiences that can steer you down different routes. So, for example, at a top level, the canonical trajectory for Uncle Royal around you looks something like start at the host venue. This is for the street player. There's a different one for online players. 
the red spot moment was something that the artist talked about time and time again as being your, your first successful engagement with the game, with the interface, with the clue trail. If you can do this basic one, we know at some level you're on track, we've got you, you're in it. Blast theory would, in Uncle Roy, mark out a number of anticipated routes through the city. And they really did this. They documented it. They had the map. They walked the city. They decided which routes they expected players to take. And they made the clues steer them towards those routes. So there was, before it ever ran, a sense of what the routes through the city ought to be. And if people were on one of these routes, they were on track. And if people were not on one of these routes, they were not on track. Then there's stuff that happens at Uncle Roy's office, the phone box and the limo. And you could, it's a multi-scale thing, you could probably take any one of these and you'd find a trajectory through it. There is a trajectory through, most definitely, the interactions in the limousine. It's scripted and rehearsed what's meant to happen in there. There is a trajectory of what's meant to happen at the host venue. If you saw on the video the person handing over the, the PDA and explaining how to use it, well that was scripted and rehearsed and our observation showed re-scripted and re-rehearsed until it was done just right. I talked about ideal, the ideal of continuity, but in practice, trajectories have to negotiate various transitions. And these are key moments at which, if you like, the whole enterprise is at risk. And what our studies showed was there are various kinds of key moments and that the artists in their craft pay particular attention to how to design those. Get it right, you may be able to create something that works more or less continuously. Get it wrong, and the whole thing may fall apart. So what are they? Beginnings is a kind of an obvious one, but the initial ritual and the initial framing of the experience, how someone's introduced, how the mood is set, how the rules are understood, uh, is, is absolutely critical. And so you see a lot of effort designed into this purpose-built briefing room, scripted rehearsed briefings and so on. Anything that involves handing over an interface uh, is a really critical moment for several reasons. I mean, if you've ever been in a, a, a virtual reality cave with some kind of a head tracking thing, then one of the typical things that happens is you kind of stand in there and they, as they put it on your head, the graphics are turned on and the whole world is kind of jumping about like crazy until it's on your head and it settles down. That's an example of the problem of handing over an interface. And um, sometimes that's designed by the artist to be minimal, that they, they aim for the easiest transition. How can I give this person a PDA they've not used before and get them into the game? Sometimes the opposite. Brendan would make a great fuss about attaching sensors to people's bodies before they go on the, the, the rides in a very, very ritualized way to, to keep building the anticipation. But in each case, it's planned and it's thought about. You don't just hand it over and say, get on with it. Episodes. Um, if you do have an experience that is spread over time, perhaps deliberately, Day of the Figurines, you only play, ideally, the plan was, you only play a bit each day. You really have to think about how to reintroduce people back into it quickly. How do you catch up with the stuff you've missed and get back into the game uh, within, well, as we were using text messages, one text message. You've got 160 characters to reintroduce that person back into the game. What have they missed? Get them back into the, the position. Um, Physical virtual traversals, for those who are interested in virtual worlds, how do you get into a virtual world? And there are various ways of doing this. Uh, my favourite was from a piece of work called Desert Rain, where the artist had a, a screen made of falling water, and you could actually pass into the image, and you would enter another piece of physical set, or the performers would appear to emerge from the image. Physical resources, such as Uncle Roy's office, the limousine, are very different to digital ones. And one of the fundamental differences is you cannot reproduce them at will. If two people turn up at the limousine in Uncle Roy at the same moment, it is a disaster. Uh, the whole illusion that you're, you're in this fictional world created just around you is broken. And even worse, they start chatting and relaxing and comparing notes and, and going completely off track. So the artist would work extremely hard to avoid two people ever turning up to the limo at the same moment. They would delay some people and push other people on 
we'll talk about orchestration in a moment, to manage that moment. If it was a digital resource, it could be different. You can replicate the office as many times as you like, no problem. But as soon as it's a physical thing, one table, one exhibit, one painting in the museum, one office, you have to think about how to manage that. Don't know how many of you worked with GPS, but um, it seems to me every time we do it, uh, and every time we work with someone new, we say, it doesn't work like you think it works, and they go, that's right. Then we go outside, and then someone stands around for 15 minutes trying to make it work, and it's, the whole thing is a disaster. So it does help to recognise from the outset that the seams in the experience, the, the bits where the technical infrastructure doesn't quite knit together, you've really got to be aware of those and design for them. If you leave somebody standing in the middle of London uh, with no connection, no way of knowing where they are, no way of them knowing what to do, you've probably got a broken experience. And last of all, endings. Uh, and in particular, one of the things we noticed, certainly with blast theory, was, was they, there would very often be a sort of coda for the experience. There'd be some kind of thing that happened after what you would have thought was the end, to just kind of take you back to it. In desert rain, they left a box of sand in your pocket of your coat, which you would find anything for five minutes to two weeks later, depending on how you use your coat. Uncle Royal around you, you got the postcard sent you through the post. But there was some kind of little moment that just kind of took you back to it. Oh, we won't talk about the transitions in Uncle Roy, there isn't time. OK, the second kind of trajectory. Are we only that far? Participant trajectories. If, um, to use Lucy Suchman's words, if, uh, if the canonical trajectory is the plan, then the participant trajectory is the situated action. It is what happens, what somebody actually does during the experience, not what was intended to happen. And the most obvious thing to say about that is it can diverge from what was meant to happen. In fact, you might argue that if you have an interactive experience, that's, that's kind of inevitably what's going to happen, giving people the choice, um, particularly uh, if it's a sort of one of those branching narrative things, there may not be much choice. The, it, you end up with a canonical trajectory that just branches a lot and comes back. And the only real choice is which branch do I go down next. But as soon as you put someone in the real world, in the city, on the streets, faced with all of the things they could do, then there is real choice. They can turn around and walk in the other direction because they're lost or bored or have given up. Uh, and divergence happens. That's OK. But there is an opposing force which is that of orchestration. And this is the set of processes, tools, procedures that you can use, you as people, or perhaps you as the system, if you can figure them out well enough to code them, um, to push that line back to that line, or perhaps to some other canonical trajectory. Maybe they're, they're so far off the original track, you have to push them onto one of your other tracks. And again, our, our studies showed that time and time again, there, was, there were very, very well thought out processes for how to do this. I mean, just one example. This is what we saw with Uncle Roy. So this is the, the bit of the canonical trajectory where you're going through the park on one of those, ideally on one of those three planned routes. And here's what the artists thought they should do if somebody, if their participant trajectory started to diverge. First of all, you would get some clues that kind of subtly tried to push you back to the main trajectory. By subtly, I mean essentially they were still within the voice of the experience. They were perhaps a bit less ambiguous, but it still felt like they were Uncle Roy's clues. And then, Blast Theory had authored around the edge of the zone a series of further clues that were much, much more explicit and clearly kind of broke the voice of the game and said, basically, turn around and go back the other way. And if you still continued, uh, they would start to worry. Uh, and try and figure out where you might be and send somebody on the streets. They have about three or four actors on the streets to deal with this to try and find you. It's not that easy in the city, but they'd have your photograph and they'd have a sense of where you were last seen and when. And they'd try and track you down. They'd come up to you and uh, they'd try and initially speak to you in the voice of the game, be a bit mysterious, send you around. And if you wouldn't listen, they'd kind of say, turn around, go back the other way. Uh, and uh, not many people in Uncle Roy were lost. We could talk about why, but. I guess if that fell down, then you really had a problem. And there were all sorts of technologies that were designed to, to support that. So this is a screenshot of the Uncle Roy orchestration interface. There's a map with the last known positions of people. 
The most critical bit on the interface actually is their disconnection history. That's the thing you really need to keep an eye on. People who are kind of connected, you can be pretty confident about they are where the system says they are, and you could talk to them if you wanted. But people who are suffering from disconnections, you've really got a problem because you don't know where they are and you can't talk to them. So you have to get them early. Lines, uh, yeah, each one of those lines is one of the current people in a uh, street player. They would cycle the street players through so you'd have more people coming into the game as it, it was a kind of rolling experience. So the green bar is basically showing where they are in the... Uh, the green bar is, is some kind of temporal representation of their... Ha has their device been connected back to the game? Have we been getting lots of messages? And red's indicating some periods of disconnection. And I can't remember what white is. Sorry. And then, the co yeah, the colour coding of the map is kind of where they, they most recently were. So we're still on participant trajectories. The other thing is to think about the social design of the experience. And this is interesting too. So um, this diagram shows that people's, people, people's participant trajectories can cross, they can diverge, they can come together. In designing these experiences, again, observations showed there were kind of several key aspects. So first of all, many people, when they design collaborative systems, design for this moment. It's all about encounters. What happens when two people get together? Perhaps they meet in space, then they can collaborate. Perhaps they meet in time, but at different spaces, then they can collaborate. And you know, a lot of attention in CSCW paid to what kind of technologies can make this happen. Good. This, however, is really, really important. Nearly all of these experiences did seem to involve moments of deliberate isolation, of getting people apart from other people and on their own, I guess sort of a bit inwardly focused, maybe lost and confused, not distracted by having family members or friends present. And this seemed to be a tactic that came up time and time again. Uncle Roy, Desert Rain, Day of the Figurines, there were moments either in the real world or in the virtual space where you were kept apart. And this also turned out to be a real problem. Any experience where you're mixing the kind of physical and the virtual, so you've got this thin connection between people, or where it's episodic and people dip in and out, keeping people together once they've formed a relationship is really hard. And so you need to design for that. In Uncle Royal Around You, you had to be remarkably tenuous as an online player to keep hold of a street player for long enough to get them to the office. It was a real achievement if you could overcome all of the potential transitions, essentially. And last of all, the historic trajectory, the third kind of trajectory out of which experiences are made. And the historic trajectory supports the retelling of the experience. So it's not what happened, it is what you want to say to somebody else happened, which is a very different thing. But it's really important to have it. Uh, I guess, I mean, well, pretty much any experience we have, we want to talk about. Anyone who's on Facebook knows that. Um, but a lot of the experiences we have, cultural ones, tend to be quite objectively shared. If we go to the cinema, OK, I know that in your head you may interpret the film differently than I do. But let's be clear, we saw pretty much the same film, and we have a pretty good sense of what the other person saw. If you do Uncle Royal around you, I have no idea what happened to you. You have no idea what happened to me. And people would come back from those experiences where there had been isolation, and time and time again say, we need to talk to somebody else. We need some way of, I need to sit down with someone and talk about what just happened and compare what happened to me with what happened to them. So historic trajectories support this. Uh, they synthesize a view of what happened. And this means four things. Firstly, you need to in some way document or record the participant trajectory. That is the, the actually what happened. That might be the system recording all of the messages that go through it. It might be people taking photos. It might be whatever. But you need a pool of documentation. You have to select and filter segments from, well, if it's a repeated experience, possibly many recordings, put those into some order that suits the story you want to tell, and then find a way of publishing them, making them available. So imagine, um, imagine it's a, you're playing a computer game with, I don't know, how many levels does a, a modern uh, complex computer game have? Quite a few, some tens, and that you repeat each level lots and lots and lots and lots of times. Imagine that the system, the game, records your interactions. Quite a lot of 3D games can do that. 
so you can play them back or compete against yourself later <coughs> on or something. Then the interesting question is, if I wanted to ask the question, what happened, say to the system, show me what happened when I played uh, whatever I was playing, it, it could filter and order those recordings in all sorts of ways. It could take my most recent attempt at each level. It could take my best attempt at each level. Or if I'm telling the story to Jonathan, it would take the versions where me and Jonathan are both in the game, because surely that's the one he's interested in knowing about. So that basically what I'm saying is, you don't just replay the experience that's happened, but you have to give people tools to tell the experience. Now, I don't have, from Uncle Roy, a good example. I mean, it was, it was an interesting, if you like, problem, perhaps even weakness with all of these experiences that we made, that there often weren't good ways of retelling them and replaying them. And so I'll now turn to um, the final bit of the talk, a quite different project where we did see canonical and participant trajectories at work outside of a kind of performance context in a much more mainstream setting, but in particular we were able to explore this idea of the historic trajectory. And the setting here is the, um, the amusement park or the theme park. Uh, and in this case, for two or three years now, we've been working with uh, Alton Towers in particular and Thorpe Park, which are kind of two of the UK's bigger theme parks. In general, looking at technologies for entertainment, so some of the ride design stuff we've done with breathing and those things have been kind of in partnership with, with these folks. But also we looked, um, as one part of it, at souvenirs and storytelling. And this kind of told us some quite interesting things about supporting the historic trajectory. So a change of setting, let's uh, get to the theme park, and we'll just spend a bit of time thinking about how people might potentially construct <coughs> their stories of a day in the park. Um, I mean, the first thing we did was a, an ethnographic study, a sensitising study, where we followed a number of families around the park. We looked at how they treated the souvenirs that were available in the park, how they talked about them. We looked at their own photo work. Uh, we visited them in their homes afterwards. We talked to them about how they used those photos and what was on display. And that uncovered a, a number of interesting things. I mean, firstly, um, the theme park is rife with souvenirs of all sorts, mugs, t-shirts, whatever, but in particular with photo souvenirs. So you probably know, you go on a ride, you come off the ride, probably, if it's a big enough ride, a system has automatically taken your photo in an attempt to capture the picture that nobody else can, and it may try and sell you that photo, in the case of Alton Towers, within two minutes of getting off the ride, past the kiosk, you buy it then, or you never buy it. That's the way it works at Alton Towers. Um, and then you get it kind of nicely mounted. But also, people, of course, take their own pictures or try to take their own pictures too. So, yeah, without going to given time too much detail, um, our studies pulled out a number of interesting themes about this construction of the historic trajectory. Uh, first of all, at Alton Towers, a common theme, not the only theme of stories, but a common one was the rite of passage. Alton Towers uh, is typified by having quite a lot of thrill rides, and um, people go time and time again, and as the kids grow up, one of the themes is doing your next big ride. <laughs> You know, sort of social bonding, being part of the family. You know, everyone's done the big ride, now it's your turn. That's quite a scary experience. And as a result, you see some contested stories. So this is the on-ride shot of Jamie. Now, I don't know if you notice anything particularly striking about that photo, but in my opinion, and apologies, Jamie, if you're watching, because I know you don't agree, because uh, you told us, I think he looks a bit scared. <laughs> I don't know what you think. Certainly, Jamie um, vetoed his parents buying this picture, absolutely vetoed it. He just would not have it. Jamie was very happy to take a medal to school and tell his schoolmates about how he'd ridden Nemesis, but that was out of the question. The mum uh, wished she'd bought the photo and spent the rest of the day, and indeed was still talking about it when we visited her in her home, about regretting not having the photo. For the family, this photo was what the day was all about, and it was a continual, and even then Jamie got ribbed throughout most of the day about every time he appeared on one of these things, he looked terrified. And he said it was the G-force that was pulling his face. <laughs> and maybe it is. I, I don't know enough physics. Who, who knows? All I can say is it's a contested story. I won't come down on any one person's side. Jamie did rather like his granddad's photo, it has to be said. Okay, So his granddad's photo shows him having conquered Nemesis, uh, and that, that photo was just fine. 
Um, the other thing to say about photo work, of course, is it's a routine part of being in the theme park. Um, often, spectators uh, capture the ride experience. So that is a classic role for the spectator, is to be the documenter of the ride. Um, Sometimes photos are taken of other things. Jamie really liked bird life. He spent a lot of the day taking pictures of birds. Uh, and there are, of course, key photo opportunities around the park. So um, to cut a long story short, as a result of these studies, we, we built a, a prototype system, if you like, to generate the historic trajectory to, to help people tell their stories about going to the park in a new way. And uh, I'll talk through it, but it's an app for your smartphone. Uh, and the first thing it does is, um, of course, you can take photographs. So you can take your own pictures. And that's good. Uh, there are various photo opportunities around the park. And we tried out some location-based prompts to encourage people to, to do this, to say there's a photo opportunity nearby. We can talk later on about how successful various location-based prompts were or weren't. Importantly, there's a shared pool. So with this app, you register as a group before you go in, you sign up as a family or a group of friends or whatever. And the rule of the game is any picture I take through the app is shared with the rest of you and you get to see it. So collectively, we, we pull our pictures. And then you can caption the pictures. You can add speech bubbles to them. Uh, and you can add captions that run along the bottom in a kind of cartoon-like style. Any captioning you do, again, the new captioned image is put back in the shared pool and everyone gets to see it. You can caption whatever you like. We use location-based triggers here to encourage um, captioning when you were in the queue. So thinking about, again, the nature of the experience, uh, we figured out queuing is a real pain, which I think everyone in the theme park business would agree is true. Um, and that if you can recognize when people are in a queue, and it's not that difficult with GPS to do that, uh, then you can give them some kind of prompt that says, now would be a really good time to look through that pool of photos and do some captioning and, have, uh, and, uh, and do a bit of photo work. We threw the unride photos into the pot. So we were able to take the, the photos off the ride systems. And they go in the shared pool the same way. You can caption them, do whatever. And then when you've been on a ride, the system encourages you to um, select three images from the pool for each ride you've done. One that you think represents before, one that you think represents during, and one that you think represents after. And this is the simplest narrative structure we could come up with for the rite of passage. I was scared. It was scary. I felt great, for example. So you do all of this work as you're going around the, the park, taking pictures, sharing them automatically, annotating them choosing the three pictures for each big ride you went on. And then the system automatically generates these. So it creates your one-page photo story for each ride you do. And this, again, it's got your three photos in there. And it's got a bunch of stock material, of course, and a bunch of branding, because that's really important in the theme park setting. And it all comes together, and you get your comic book page of your story. So, this is a historic trajectory. What's interesting, I suppose, is um, firstly, you get one for your ride. That's quite important. If you read these ones carefully, you'll notice different people definitely want to tell different stories. There are some that are suitable for children. There are some that are definitely uh, more adult-oriented among groups of friends. So not everyone wants to tell the same story. But you are telling that story from a pool of shared material. So in terms of the historic trajectory, I think it reflects most of the, the points I made earlier about, firstly, you have to think about how you document the experience. There are triggers and points in the application to encourage you to do that. How you sift and select, and how you reorder and represent to make your kind of shared account. I will skip over this very briefly, but um, Although I've, I've talked about the theme park and the historic trajectory, it was quite evident that, to us, the other kinds of trajectory I talked about, canonical and participant, were also at play in the theme park. So uh, the canonical trajectory of a theme park, the plan, can be quite complicated. It's co-constructed by both the park and the visitors. But if you wanted a general shape for it, it looks something like this. People arrive, often together. People split up. I want to do Nemesis. I want to do the Squirrel Nut Ride. Um, 
People come together again, lunch, coffee, they replan, they split up again. And at each ride, they also often split up. I'll go on the ride, I'll hold the bags. Uh, without going into more detail, orchestration work becomes difficult for people. They spend a great deal of time trying to orchestrate where these trajectories come together in particular. Meeting someone at the end of a ride is really quite difficult because you don't know how long the queue is, you don't know how long the ride is. There's, I don't know, 20 people coming through every five minutes, so you hang around for hours. Meeting people for lunch is also really difficult because you don't know when their ride is finished and they don't know when yours has. Equally, when it comes to interrupting people, uh, we think we learnt some of our notifications were good, some of our notifications were bad. So in terms of opportune moments for mobile notifications, um, when the spectator is queuing, oh, sorry, when the rider is queuing before they get on the ride, good time. I'm generalising a great deal here. Um, there are many fine nuances. When spectators are waiting around, quite a good time. When people are coming together, quite a bad time to notify them because at that point they're engaged in lots and lots of other social stuff. Like, hi, I haven't seen you in a bit, what's going on? And the last thing they need is a bunch of system notifications saying, don't forget to do your atomic. Um, and there are various other points. I mean, the rider, when they're on the ride, you just no point interrupting them because they can't get their mobile out. It's, it's disallowed. So um, I guess I'm suggesting that these trajectories are also quite a useful way of starting to think about things like mobile notifications, interruptions, and possibly how they work as well. So look, I'm pretty much out of time, I'm sure. Um, what have I tried to do? Well, a bit of a journey, I think, first of all, from some stuff that is very much at the kind of cutting edge, I suppose, of kind of performance and art, but which I think inspired some thinking about mainstream experiences. But then try to suggest to you that some of the ideas we got from that about what user experiences are like and what goes into them, canonical participant and historic trajectories that are designed, how that might also be found in more mainstream settings. The theme park full of trajectories. Each ride is a trajectory. And then the layout of the rides in the park are are designed in some sense. So I'm trying to suggest to you that there is perhaps a, a, a broader relevance of this notion of designing trajectories, transitions, orchestrations, divergences, all of the things I've said. So that leaves me with a few questions that I don't have answers to. Assuming that you believe it is a useful way of thinking even about cultural applications, I, I do, um, is it useful outside of those? Can you think about the trajectory of having a disease, for example, when going through the healthcare system? Can you think about the trajectory of going on holiday? Can you think about the trajectory of online shopping and use and eventual disposal of an artifact? Does it have the same sense of participant, canonical and historic? Do you need to document and reflect on them? Are there the same social overlappings? Interesting. Career. Or having a career or a life. Is there a lifelong trajectory? Now, these are all good questions. Um, do they provide a general basis for understanding this notion of extended user experience? Um, one particular thing that we haven't thought about, I think, hardly at all at the moment, is how different trajectories of different experiences overlap. So although I said, oh yeah, two different participants in Uncle Roy, you need to think about how they design, that was all still within Uncle Roy. Never said anything about how Uncle Roy overlaps with receiving your work email overlaps with being in the theme park, overlaps with shopping. At any one moment, you and I are involved in probably several trajectories or threads of activity. And the whole nature of mobile devices is that they are increasingly connected and rubbing up against one another. The mobile phone is essentially a time slicing device. That's what it does. It lets you cut up your time into finer and finer chunks. And so these trajectories get potentially more and more interwoven. So how do we design that? And um, I'm comfortable, at least in my own head, because I understand what I'm talking about, I think, um, that trajectories are kind of useful for reflecting on experiences that I've seen. I can now take all sorts of experiences that have been documented and say, ah, look, here's the canonical trajectory. Look, here's the historical trajectory. But I'm not sure I can use one yet as a proactive design tool. I'm not sure I can sit down with a blank page and no experience and say, let's use them from the start. We're making our first attempt. We've, we've got a project called Chess, which is working, doing museum design in the Acropolis Museum in Greece and 
City Dispass, which is a big space museum in Toulouse. And there, for the first time, we are trying to say to the designers from the outset, hey, let's think about trajectories uh, and see whether any of the issues that we raise make any sense. But I'll be honest and say, I don't know yet. The conversation is just starting. Yeah. Um, but the, at the level of the when it's a good time to interrupt or not interrupt, doesn't that wouldn't that be something that you would build into the design? Or? So that's what you would hope, yes. And uh, and what we what we're trying to encourage is whether you can write these things down. But you know, it's interesting. Then all sorts of questions about yeah, what does the annotation look like? Does it look like my wiggly lines? Does it look like whatever, so how, yeah, how you express this stuff and how you write it down and really whether it has a kind of proactive purchase and design, I think, so, uh, yeah, it would be a, definitely a question for the future. So look, that's it. By wild coincidence, there is a book. Uh, the book documents the Blast Theory works, um, Brendan's works, and some works with other artists as well. Uh, but it then does kind of pull out, in a hopefully quite a grounded way, this, this notion of trajectories. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much for asking once again. Thanks for your time and attention. Thank you. Um, so, you know, when you're talking about trajectories, one of the things that strikes me is that in a typical theme park sort of environment, uh, one of the big things that you try to prevent is everybody going the same way, because <laughs> that, that generally leads to horrible congestion problems, and so, you know, a lot of effort is spent to try and make sure that the trajectories of, you know, individual people are, you know, tend to vary as much as possible. Um, so you don't get that sort of buildup. Whereas in contrast, if you look at like an IKEA, mm -hmm. right, you have you know a single path that you were pretty much forced to take through the entire store, so you experience everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <right? laughs> With and, one short path or two. Yeah, but they're, they you know try to hide is. them. <laughs> <laughs> they really don't want you doing that because they want you to see everything. Or you know, as opposed to like a supermarket, right, where they put the milk and stuff in the back to try and force your trajectory. You know, so a lot of this has to do, I guess, with the different goals, right, of, of what people are trying to achieve. You know, for the theme park case, you know, the crowd control one it seems sort of ancillary to the experience, but it's actually a pretty fundamental, you know, pragmatic thing that you have to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in, in Alton Towers, when we asked about the design and layout of the theme park, that the rationale there, uh, and I don't, I don't know if it's the same at Disney or not, the rationale there is that the big rides are spread out towards the back of the park. So you come in and basically you're then immediately pushed into, is it actually, like on Croix, it's three choices, there are three big zones, uh, the X Factor, the Thrill Zone and Ugland or whatever, and you're, yeah, you're shunted out to those paths and then later on you sort of find your way back and that seems very deliberate, it's quite interesting. So, so, so how do you deal with explicitly trying to have you know, a very large number of trajectories? It's not, you know, it's very hard, you know, in the theme park case, you typically don't have just a handful of fixed paths. You know, hopefully you have thousands of different ones on any given day. Yeah, so, I mean, it's, it is multi-scale and, uh, and they're not, it's quite clear, I think, you know, that, Things like Uncle Royal around you are quite an extreme case in that it is a, a really pretty prescripted and designed experience. You know, it doesn't exactly run on rails, but it's quite clear what's meant to happen from the outset. The theme park is interestingly different. Each ride is very much like that. You know, you, you, you go on Nemesis, you're in the queue, and at that point, you're in a, like Ikea, you're in a linear trajectory, you're going through the queue, you're getting on the ride, you're up the ramp, you're down the ramp, you're off, and that there it's in a line. But yeah, the layout of those within the park seems to then be based on some more general trajectory principles. But what happens is people, when they arrive, construct their own trajectory. Um, are they sort of, I assume that they've analyzed the different, there's patterns in the trajectories that people take. Um, it feels like there's a ton of basic generalizations. Like people will ride a ride, and then they will go to the ride that's right next door, or they will go to the bathroom, or will like stand in a queue. Yeah. That list is short. And um, yeah, and there's an I mean there's in the areas there's an ecology of attractions. There's a few big rides, a bunch of eateries, some other shops and some smaller stuff to do. So again, that's part of it. And that the trajectory thing is again the extent to which people plan in advance what they're going to do. Now not everyone does, but 
again, our experience suggests that quite a lot of people do plan their day in the car on the way. <laughs> what are we going to do? Yeah, yeah, well. and then, then the situated action at lunch, they tend to have to replan. So, yeah, the canonical trajectory is kind of more flexibly constructed in the theme park, for sure. It's negotiated quite a bit more, I think, yeah. I, I can think of one case when, uh, when Animal Kingdom first opened, um, one of the things that was unplanned was that people quickly figured out that the animals are awake in the morning and they <laughs> sleep the rest of the day. And so uh, it quickly came to be that people would line up at the gate as soon as it opened. They all run like crazy for the <laughs> safari ride. And you get this instant huge line there, and the rest of the park is completely empty. Yeah. And uh, there was a lot of effort spent in trying to fix that problem. <laughs> I'd love to. Yeah, I'd love to know what the fix is. Yeah. Please. Um, so, so you started out saying you've been working with artists, and that the, the thing that you kind of ended with was uh, something that's more in the entertainment mm. and consumer aspect of it. And uh, well, I wanted to say, first of all, thank you for saying that industry and artists can work together collaboratively in an interesting way as opposed to uh, sometimes now I think culturally people think that industry helps artists as a charity as opposed to it being an equivalent kind of dialogue that they can perform each other. But um, so I guess I'm sort of curious just, um, why work with artists when it seems like, you, I mean this could be something that could be done in marketing or design um, or something that's more highly, the, the canonical trajectory is very highly and tightly scripted. Um, but you are interested in working with, or at least at the beginning you were sort of interested in working with artists who I think their canonical trajectory are very different in terms of their communication that say advertising executives would have or say um, marketing executives would have. And um, the experience, like having a trajectory is, is a similar idea, but I think that the intermediate parts are very different in terms of when you work with an artist on an artist project as opposed to going to a theme park where already Sort of things are very set. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I guess, uh, yes, yeah, so I think you're right in your observations. I mean, the question was still, you know, why work with artists in that, that, that context? I mean, I think it does go back to the reasons I gave at the outset. Um, I think artists are very, very extremely creative and therefore trailblaze things you can do with technology that I, I think the mainstream. Uh, entertainment industries, for all of its fantastic research and creativity, may not quite trailblaze the same thing. It's not saying that uh, research in mainstream entertainment industries isn't valuable. Lots and lots of deep, difficult problems being solved, but I still think that artists just go somewhere unusual, and I think they do act as trailblazers. Not that every artist does commercial crossover work or wants to do commercial crossover work. Some, I'm sure, would reject it out of hand, but I've seen quite a lot of examples of absolutely where it does work quite a few of the industry projects, quite a lot of the projects we've done have had industry partners involved to an extent. Uncle Royal Around You uh, had involvement of um, British Telecom, Day of the Figurines had Nokia and Sony who were kind of in there as, as partners. It felt mostly kind of watching, seeing what was going on, kind of taking it in. So there is that crossover, I think. So yeah, I think you work with artists because it does take you, takes you out there Take, takes you somewhere unusual, makes you think, what was that that just got made? And then makes you think, how, how is what just got made perhaps more relevant to anything else? Now, although I also like the other side that you got to at the end, which is going outside of the theme park into the, into the real world. And I think uh, the Adjustment Bureau sort of, uh, you saw the Adjustment Bureau, I think the, the movie, the Matt Damon, well, okay, it's, it's basically, it's, it's this on the, in fact, it's Philip K. Dick's story, and it's, it's this on a grander scale. That, uh, that in fact, there is this choreography that's, uh, okay. Has anybody seen the Adjustment Bureau? Yeah. <laughs> sure. Do uh, you agree that it's, it's, it's what, it, it has some relevance here? Maybe, maybe the Philip K. Dick's novel would be worth reading. Uh, so I, uh, but I think that, that that is an interesting additional angle to it. Um, I guess one, one thing I was thinking of is that if I if I wanted to use the notion of trajectories, say in a, in a project, some future project, like and maybe I already have an experience of trying to characterize what's going on by this notion of trajectories. So I start I look at the thing and I and I start writing things down and I say, oh, this event happened. Maybe I do a, do a few of those diagrams that you have, and pretty soon I realize, you know, oh shit, this is starting to get really complicated, and there's so many different ways to experience. The thing, and I, and I just I feel like I'm, I'm, 
I'm going to be very quickly confronted by the complexity mm -hmm. of uh, how do you how do you just write it down yeah, and yeah. talk about it, manipulate it, or you know, worse yet, you know, what if I had a sensing system that that you know watches people moving through my experience and um, and then you know, uh, you know upchucks this representation based on the sense you know maybe I fit some data I don't know just yeah I'm worried that that the, you know, the complexity of reality is going to just you know be, uh, yeah really troublesome for these representations uh, I th I think that's correct I mean firstly. Yeah, first point is, yeah, the complexity of reality is great. It is really complex. And so what you're trying to do is, whenever you're making one of these things, you are designing a complex, multifaceted thing. Um, I don't think that writing down trajectory diagrams will, and in spite of the fact I said, ah, there is only, everything is made up of this. It, it won't give you the whole answer. And I also think it would be impossible to write down in detail all of the trajectories of any of these experiences. And I've never done it. So yeah, I don't think you soon, you just give up. You think, oh, it's yet yeah, another layer, another too much. So in that sense, I don't think that's the right thing to try and do. What I think you need to try and do though is, is take the key elements of the idea and ask the question of, hmm, where is the historic trajectory in this experience? Do I, do I have a way of retelling, recapturing, representing? If not, is that a problem? Should I have one or does it not need one? The transitions, I think, are useful. You can take each of those transitions and tick them off and go, yeah, where and what are the seams? What should I do about it? Where do interfaces get handed over? What's the first engagement? How's the framing done? So I think at that level, it, at least it gives you, in my, I would hope, a, a kind of checklist that you can run that says, OK, have I got one of these? Is there one of these? Why not? Uh, without necessarily, then the next question is, yeah, do you need to put it, do you need to set it out in more detail? And that's where we are with the chess project and saying, yeah, is it useful in a more constructive sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm also very intrigued by the notion that you could, you know, model, you know, automatically sort of a, what, what are the things that everyone does, uh, you know, uh, at this moment in this experience, yeah. right? Sort of a, figuring out, you know, finding things you don't already know through yeah. the use of, of sensing technology. But, um, but it certainly is hard to do, and probably impossible to do that in advance. And I mean, if, I suppose you could think of it as being a bit like storyboarding. You know, storyboarding and experience is useful, but you probably can't write a storyboard for every nuance of it. There's always, there's always things you miss in the interstitials between the frames, you know, and I think it's like that. Yeah, I think, I think there's opportunities to look at it. I mean, at a life scale, you know, the number of de detours is potentially infinite. But, you know, start with a linear two, you know, movie, yeah, there's no detours in the sense of interactive gaming, you have more so you can kind of define the uh, detour points. And, you know, kind of at a life level, I wonder if there's some opportunities around cell phones where, you know, that, that's often the interrupter that kind of presents you with new detours because somebody sent you a text or says, here, let's go eat that. Uh, and so maybe there's some filtering opportunities there with, you know, if you really want to stay on it on a life trajectory, you know, you don't want to make that stop at McDonald's or something. It reminds me of, uh, so John Crum has this project where he's trying to model trajectories of people driving, right, and so he can, he can attempt to predict where you're going based on, you know, just a few miles out, out of your driveway. For, for, fairly reliably. It's, it's kind of uh, a little scary in some way how, how boring we are. But, <laughs> uh, it's, it's, and it's all data driven. Yeah. That's also, driving's a really interesting one, isn't it? Because there's a sense in which, if you were trying to, to think about, as I say, the, the open question for us is to what on earth does it mean to actually then put different experiences together? Something like driving is quite interesting because that's one that feels like it probably dominates others when you do it in quite an interesting way. You know, when you drive, there are certain things you really do have to do to be safe, and there are certain constraints spatially you are going to satisfy certain constraints you're going to satisfy, not leaving each other. If you're in the car with each other, you're going to be there for the next three hours. So it's, it's quite interesting about, oh yeah, whether some trajectories essentially would shape others a lot more that then have to fit against them. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for your questions.